All right, technical difficulties. We're back. We're back. Yeah. See, the thing I tested this today and uh, not held out for Nicole or something. <laughs> anyway, so we were talking about the different course things could have gone and how you oh. said the way things ended up was actually better for project than the other two ways it would have been. Yeah, I mean, you think about the sound of project in the 90s, you know, with black tape and love spirals and soul rolling somewhere in Lycia. Yeah. And there was this in other bands, Love Lies Crushing and stuff like that. It was all about atmospherics. And I don't know if what Will and I would have done. I, first of all, I don't think it could have sustained itself. You know, you can only do, I mean, I think Byzantine Next Gate is probably about the end of that style exploration i mean what more can you do with those sort of military boom boom beats right um well let's just be honest too he never would have stuck around you know and what john and i did i think was maybe almost too conventional maybe for what project was because we we were still i mean if you listen to those damn songs their songs just guitar bass drums vocals first chorus first chorus break yeah, yeah. chorus, and you know you know, we came strongly from um, the post-punk background, you know, and our the bands that we listened to were like um, Echo and the Bunnymen and Psychedelic Furs and Joy Division and The Cure and Killing Joke Boss, you know, so that's, you know, these are post-punk rock bands. Right. And Big Black. I, and yeah, that later on down the line, Big Black had an influence on us too. Um, project was more sort of an ambient um ethereal label and lycia had never been anything but maybe an atmospheric post-punk band you know through our early days and then the demos and what john and i had worked on and so i i don't think that lycia ever would have ended up being this sort of dark wave band or slow motion atmospheric band we would have been more probably a traditional you know post-punk um 4ad-esque type band um and probably more towards the post-punk stuff and i don't know if that would have resonated with the, the fans of the project label but what but lycia did would have did been interested in that in the long run either you know yeah it was different than what the other bands were um the sound that came from Ionia was almost like a total accident I, I I think maybe it was finally me realizing a, an idea that I had in the very early 80s I remember being in some of my early bands and me trying to explain that one day I wanted to have my own band that sounded like intros breaks and extras <laughs> now if you think about that like I use the example of dumb dumb waiters for the psychedelic furs or in a lonely place by New Order where the song gets to the end and it just goes off into the spacey sounds bouncing all all over or you hear you know intros to songs that are that way or breaks and I just thought let's just eliminate the song and just have the intros that breaks in the extra, yeah. extras and just make it spacey and chaotic and everyone ah you you and your crazy idea let's go back and write a new wave pop song you know yeah yeah. Well, I'm glad that that happened because I think that, you know, um, doing things not the typical way ends up being better for most people generally in the long run because there's how many bands that sound exactly the same and you remember them for a few years and then you forget about them. And when somebody does their own thing and then continually evolves, you know, that those are the people that keep going and keep going and keep going and they don't get stale and um you know you still you you know you still have something to say with music you're not just repeating yourself and doing the same thing over and over and over i mean there's only so much you can do like you said there's only so much you could do with xk decade Decada. yeah if you don't if you don't evolve and you know you no one wants to hear the same song over and over and over for album after album after album after album 
you know. Well, I mean, we are more than aware of that. It's, I think it's funny that there's this perceived that Lycia has this Lycia sound. We were talking about this today. Right. I think what a lot of people perceive to be the Lycia sound is maybe only like about 10% of our work. You know, you just take, yeah. um, you know, resigned or the realization or something like these just slow motion songs. But, you know, you can, there, we, Lycia is, I think we have a sound, but I think we've covered a lot of different territory. Sure, yeah. I mean, like you think about like just from Wake to Ionia. Yeah. And then like two then, different. Yeah. But still. Um, yeah, you know. And just like, I mean, I know we're working on a new album. People haven't heard anything off of there yet, but all four songs sound completely different. Like, could be four different bands. I think what we did on in Flickers is going to be continued on to this album and Flickers is all over the place. And uh, I think I mentioned in the earlier thing we did um, that I think there were question marks within the band, even if I was gonna pull this together. I remember Dave told me after it came out, he's like, I didn't see how this different material was going to fit together I really didn't see it but man you pulled it together I went into it and I wanted to come from all these different angles because I know that that's what Lycia has been over the years and then to go from all these different areas but still make it feel like an album to me in Flickers is the most Lycia album of all Lycia albums yeah because it's got a little bit of everything I think that to me, that's exciting. Like to me, it's boring to just keep doing the same style all the time. Like I get super excited doing different stuff, you know, like just even within the band, you know, every, like you did, uh, I can't remember when you did this, but a few months back, it's been a while now, we all did our own um, mix of uh, for Spotify. Yeah. And it was interesting to see, like, there was a couple cross pollination between the four of us, but like, you could see how different all four of us are drawing from different, inspir- you know, different inspirations and whatever. And then the past couple albums, you know, have had a lot of that. And to me, that's just fun. Um, that's why I always got, you know, super stoked when like, band like uh, you know bands from sort of different genres would you know ask me to do vocals for them because it was exciting to do something completely different um Mm -hmm. you know that's exciting to me i don't know why people want to just do the same thing over and i mean and and that's not to say you're not you're still being true to yourself because you have different aspects of yourself different styles and whatever it's not like you're being like i'm gonna re- be a rapper today you know it's not like fake or anything like that it's just exploring different elements of things that you like and uh, and to me that's normal because you know i'm i like stuff all over the place so why would i want me to you know to do music that all sounds the same that's boring yeah i just i like i I have a, as you well know, I have a super wide range of things I like. I like a lot of stuff that people would be shocked at. And I dislike a lot of stuff that people would also be shocked at. Right. Same. You know, I, like anyone else, I just have my taste and it's all over the place. And I think, um, you know, I think the new EP we're going to work, we're working on right now is really going to reflect all these different things that we're into now for sure yeah and um, super exciting I, like can't wait for it to be done and because i want to hear it yeah I don't know, it's not done so i can't wait for it to be done and i'm super excited about it yeah um and it's sort of a bizarre accident that it even happened in the first place yeah. it started with doing a, a, a split with another band um, then, you know, because of COVID and the, um, the activity of the other band in a very active time and me, of me being impatient as well as coming up with a, a second song, I said, well, let's move this up to be our own single. Yeah. And then 
out of the blue, um, John sends me the our friends electric files and say, hey, you want to work on the song with me? So I start working on that. And then John's like, I got some other synths things to send. So we ended up not working on that. We're working on some other stuff instead. But it just sort of went from being a split to a single. And then, then it was like, okay, let's try to make this maybe an EP. And then at one point, I, I got a little ambitious. So let's make it into a full LP. Then after a couple of days of think, thinking, well, I don't want to put pressure on myself to write something that I'm not even, hadn't been motivated to write yet. Yeah. So I was like, let's scale it back to a six song EP. And um, today we finished um, this, the, the pre-mastered mix of song number four. Song number five is done except for me laying some vocals down. And then there's just one last song that we'll, we'll and work the on. And thing about that is once, because this is almost kind of done. And then once this is done, then we can go do the song for that split. Yeah, I know that's the, that's the strange irony is that in the end, we'll probably still end up doing the split. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> I know that uh, on that side of it, they still want to do it. So yeah, yeah, well, you know, it's scheduling, but we'll. But no, yeah, and then after that, we'll probably just lay low for a while because that's just the way. Yeah, I rolled. Um, after we did fifth, you know, I consider the song, the album that, or the release that was our comeback after like a hiatus was Fifth Son, mm -hmm. and. After that, I wasn't sure if we were if I if we were going to do anything, and I just started messing around. I mean, after a couple of years, I decided to proceed, and that became Quiet Moments. And then we did a line that connects. But after a line that connects, we were I felt, and you probably remember this when we were driving back to Michigan and Ohio, that um, 2015 after the album came out, and I was telling you. You know, I think this album pretty much has said everything that I want to say. And I feel like I can comfortably walk away now. And I really felt that way. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I think in the late 90s when when I, when I, we, we sort of disappeared, I felt very dissatisfied. And so the, the early 2000s, I just felt horrible because I felt like we ended on such a bad note because of the way it seemed to fizzle out, you know, a whole bunch yeah, of- it wasn't positive. No, there was just, it, it was just like about three, four years that involved health and change in music environment. And, but for Lycia, at least, it just fizzled out. And we, we went from being, you can't do anything wrong to the record stores don't want to carry you. But um, after a line that connects, I just thought, okay, this was a good couple record, run on handmade birds great boutique label good experience for us you know we had this brief little return of being relevant and and quiet moments and a line that connects were just so they covered all this territory that i always wanted to cover and i felt very satisfied and i remember we were driving back and i said to you i could just walk away and feel like i said what i had to say yeah and then somehow, some way, and flickers just percolated. And then I got that done, and I was the same thing. I'm like, okay, now I really said everything that I have to say, and now I can walk away feeling satisfied. And all I'm going to do is sit around the house and play the classical guitar, you know, which is or how it happens. try to teach myself, yeah, you know, finger picking and playing a nylon string guitar again and doing some classical and flamenco styles I dabble in it not very good but i you know it's fun but what does it end up now i'm thinking okay now we're gonna do a single we'll do, we'll do one last split single yeah that turns into a single and then turns into an ep yeah. and now now it's like, okay, now we're going to do another split and we're going to start doing a bunch of reissues and, oh, wait a minute. And, you know, maybe we'll do some more restoration prog pro you know, re-recordings. And I've been, it's oh, like that. Cool hat. What's that? And, and, and also here's a cool hat. Oh, and a cool hat. <laughs> and some 
potentially other cool things. Yeah, the, some other merch uh, in the upcoming soon. Yeah, yeah. I uh, mean, and it, it it's all good. I think as long as it's fun and I mean, it's not always fun just because it's work also, but I mean, it's satisfying, I guess would be the correct. Uh, it feels like more like, to me, it feels like a lifelong compulsion. Like I have to do it. Like yeah. I don't do it. There's something wrong, but it's a love hate relationship for sure. But um, I mean, it's, it's what I do. Yeah. And, you know, I never, ever ever thought that i'd still be doing music at the age i am right now i mean 57 years old i mean i always envisioned that i would stop at like age 35 or something yeah. and yet i think the last if i had if someone if some someone came down to me right now and said okay we're going to just let you pick a few things from your from your music career to be remembered by and everything else will be washed away. Oh. I, I would feel very comfortable with saying, let's just have the second era. Hmm. Fifth son to what we're working on now. That's how satisfied I how how well I felt about it. I mean, I'm never a hundred, I mean I'm a pretty insecure guy, so I never really feel a hundred percent satisfied, but I feel that this is the only time in my music career that I had the control over everything from, yeah. I mean, I, I control everything from the mix to the recording, to, to construction, um, to what label it's on, whether or not we do, whether I, how I participate or lack of participation in the, any kind of like interviews. I just feel really comfortable with this era. And because of that, it flavors my perception that this is right. the good. Whereas in the nineties, I was such a malleable guy, you know, you know, my past, my youth and how it's made me at the same time feel like I have to control everything, but by the same token, I want to be involved with nothing. And that, right. that is the ultimate conflict that I can never Really, really rectify inside myself and in the 90s I was dominated by the insecure elements of it and so I was malleable you know I knew what I wanted on on, on most of those albums and I couldn't follow through I didn't feel confident to follow through because I think when I would hint at my ideas they were unconventional and even a funny look about it would set me off like, uh, you know, they're not right. going to be into this. And then instead of taking control of my own destiny, I gave my, my control to other people. And, you know, that makes me uncomfortable. Whereas now I'm controlling, it's like controlling the words coming out of your mouth. Imagine if you didn't have control over the stuff that was coming out of your mouth. Sometimes I feel like I don't have control. <laughs> Out of my mouth. Uh, <laughs> no but yeah, i think that that's the the thing is that you always want to be that person that just sits back and lets other people do it but yeah. then you're the the aspect of you that doesn't think other people will do it right and then it, when you do let people do it then you're frustrated that they didn't do it how you wanted to do it and then even so though you didn't tell them that the constant yeah even though they they can't read your mind yeah but so there's this constant like i don't want to be involved but i have to be involved but i don't want to be involved yeah so you're never really um like fully satisfied now yeah. if we could find a mind reader that could mm. really read your mind then you could not be involved and just let them deal with it but you know that's not going to happen so it's your band. You have to deal with it, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, well, and in the nineties, in the nineties, I, I never felt in control of my own destiny. Yeah. I never did. I, it, I felt, I felt almost like I was in an out of control car and just riding along, you know, it's like, I, 
I think the most comfortable I was in the 90s was at the germination stages of all the albums. Mm. When I was just, you know, wherever my home studio was, you know, and I was just demoing real basic things. And then I would be like, okay, I can see where this is going to go. And I feel really good about it. But then it would, as the album would start to develop and things would pick up steam, you know, sometimes it, the wheels come off. I don't, well, I don't know why, but I would just back off on that same level of focus and control. And I think it's because I just felt just petrified of failing. For sure. Yeah. And so it was like, okay, these are my ideas and I know what I want, but man, if I go with these ideas, because a lot of my studio techniques, which I use now and are just st status quo for us, seemed really crazy back then. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I got tired of suggesting things and then feeling like, oh my God, this guy, like you feel incompetent to a degree mm. and you don't want to feel, you, you want to feel like you know what you're doing. And so I, I just learned, I guess, just to back off and say, okay, you can handle it. All right. Yeah, that's great. And I'm thinking, oh no, man, you need more of this and this, but you don't right. feel that sense to like go and, and get in someone's, you know, business and say, no, I'll do it this way and this way. Cause the insecurity was just so strong yeah, in me. Cause I was just part of that is the insecurity because you think, oh, yeah. well, they, they're a professional. They must know better than I do. And I don't know what I'm doing. Right. Yeah. Even though you do, but you just don't think you do. You just don't think you do. Yeah. I mean, and I, so relatable. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that constantly. I mean, you saw me have a mental breakdown this morning trying to record yeah. vocals and I'm like I literally at one point was smashing myself in the face I'm like I can't do this and I don't know why I can't do it and it was freaking me out like I I couldn't I just couldn't figure it out and then you start thinking oh my god I just really am not good at this <laughs> yeah. somehow you you know I, somehow I I managed to fake this or something and then now i have to do this for this other person and i'm not figuring it out and i can't figure it out and i i'm failing miserably and i'm going to be a huge disappointment and they thought they were getting a good vocalist and they're getting this hack that mike just fixes in the studio with wizardry and you know this whole thing starts happening and it's the same thing that happens with writing where i'm always like I don't belong in the same room with real authors. They're like real authors. I'm just this person that has Google Docs and makes up stories and I'm not like a real author, <laughs> you know? So it's kind of, I'm sure that's the same thing. Like when you're in the studio with people that it's their studio, they know the equipment and you're just like give, throwing out ideas and they're looking at you like, that's crazy, you know? Especially going back to the to the eighties, I told you about the eighties that you know no one took anything that that we did serious back then. And I remember being in a studio. Some it was a, a studio you know you we found in the local music newspaper, and it was eight track studio in a strip mall. And we <laughs> went over there, and you know they actually when we went there to um, book the studio time flotsam and jetsam was practicing there it was in the 80s and they were like a, a, a new local band here yeah. and they were just using it as a rehearsal space and they had to stop practicing while we booked our studio time That's funny. But, um, me and the, the guy that i was working with at the time went to this in the studio and we brought a, um, a couple of um, high school kids that were real good musicians because the band we were in the time was falling apart and we, we needed some people to do the sessions and <laughs> and we were in there and man i didn't know that part the engineer you know anyone that knows lycia's guitar sound it's it's full of effects now most bands a lot of so many bands do that now right but in 1987 or whatever it was English bands were doing it, but over here in, in at least in the in the Phoenix, Arizona area, it was either heavy metal or REM influence, alternative rock. And so when I came in there and I had like six foot pedals and it was just like whoosh, the sound guy was like, nope, we don't record that way here. 
we record clean and then we use the professional effects on mixdown. And I was just like, oh, okay, yes, sir. Right, right. You're you're a studio, I'm just me. And you talk about taking something that was wonderful and turning it into something horrible, that's it. Yeah. You retort it because, you know, you play with your effects, the way you bend notes and move. So here I am playing what sounds just like a clean guitar. And then he's adding distortion and chorus and delay. I'm like, give it a good delay. To me, a good delay is boom, boom, boom. Give me a good delay. His good delay was boom. No, more. Boom. No, big delay. Boom, boom. <laughs> Can you turn some reverb on? Yeah, sure. It sounded like someone talking like, in their bathroom. I'm talking about a cave. Yeah. Right, right, right. Finally, you know, it's like being in a taxi cab. You know, the it's ticking. We owe money. Right. You can't argue with the guy for an hour. So I just oh, did wow. what he said. Yeah. And the demo is horrible because my guitar sounds like crap. You know, so I don't know. Thing too, is that, you know, the stuff that people come up with, um, that's crazy. That's crazy. You don't do that in the studio later becomes commonplace that everybody mm -hmm. does. I mean, it's the people that kind of don't play by the rules that push the equipment that end up finding new techniques that later become standard run of the mill technique. You, when we lived in Ohio, you remember going on those equipment runs to the yeah. music stores and my questions and their answers. Yeah. I was always on the, the lookout for equipment that they sell now. Right. But wasn't available then. Yeah. You know, because we were such an, uh, a, a different type of band. I was always on the, I was always just brainstorming about different ways to solve our road problems. And I'd be like, well, what if they make something that does this, 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 and this? And I'd go to the electronic counter at the different music stores there and I'd ask them and they'd be like, oh no, that kind of stuff doesn't exist. That's crazy. And yeah. then, you know, 15 years later, every band has it. And obviously it's for the same reason that- Right. You know, there are tons of people going around asking the same question. Sidebar. Do you remember going into Woodsy's and Kent and the guy from Dink was their electronics guy? Yeah. And you asking him these questions. Yeah. Yeah. There was no answer. No, I mean, <laughs> it is what it is. He probably had the same issues when they played live. <laughs> he probably, he probably wanted the same equipment. Yeah. I mean, they were out touring too, you know, yeah. Yeah. probably having the same sound issues and what if he whatever. still wants Woodsies. Probably not. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? That's funny. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Equipment. Now we need to get that. Uh, well, no, we don't. I was going to say we need to get that um, live stuff going, but we're not going to, even if we do play live, it's not going to be like the old days. So. No, you know. Um, I, I think, I think the problem with the way we used to do it is that you become so reliant on technology that you sort of lose, lose your musicianship. Um, in the eighties, I played in a lot of different bands and I was just a guitar player. And even though I played through a lot of effects, you know, I really prided, prided myself on being a good guitar player. And I, I, I took great pride in that. I didn't make mistakes. I think one of the biggest compliments is when a buddy, um, a guy was in a band with one of his buddies came over with a four track to record one of our practices. And I, I heard him say to his friend, does he ever make a mistake about me? And I was like, wow, that, you know. And then as you well know, in, in the nineties, <laughs> in the nineties, when um, we would be on the road, it didn't feel like music sometimes to me. I mean, we're playing to this tape and, I'm just literally going one note, slide to the next note, slide to the next note, slide to the next note. 
And I was like, wow, this is so simplistic. And where back in the eighties, I actually was, you know, playing complicated arpeggios and all kinds of advanced chording. And now here I'm playing these simple notes and well, you're back to that though now. Well, no, I, I'm sort of back to where I started. Yeah. That's back. You're back. Yeah. To because complicated stuff. you know, when we, when all this, you know, we started doing some performing from home stuff. I, we actually started doing it well before COVID, you know, like three or four years ago. Just around the and then, yeah. And I would like set up all my guitar effects and everything. And it was just so much work. I had stuff all over the place and you're just spending as much time making sure your mouth is close to the microphone and that everything's plugged in and everything's good. And it just reminds me of when we toured in the nineties and I'm just, I'm like, I'm the sound technician. I'm the guitar player. I'm the singer. I'm running the smoke machine. I'm running the lights, you know, and you heard me complain about this. I'm like, I just want to be a performer. Yeah. I want to just go out and sing and play guitar. I don't want to have to worry about all this other stuff because it's so distracting. And when we started doing these from home stuff and I'm setting the equipment up, those same, that same level of frustration. What is that? Uh, gigantic. thing like a u-haul or something i don't know oh. but anyways when we would be um trying to set up and as you well remember um doing the old electronic set and that show we did in 2009 is a perfect example of that it almost feels like to me with all those cords and everything around you like you're being tied up you know yeah. you don't have that freedom yeah and so when we started doing the stuff around the house here during COVID where we were just doing the raw stuff, initially I'm like, okay, let's refine this and then start adding effects. But then one day it just clicked on me that really the freedom of playing live is just play live. Stop worrying about it all the frills. Like it, it, it sounds better. Like when we were trying to do that one um, video and we had the effects and stuff, it, you remember it just wasn't working? It wasn't and working. Like, let's just go back to plug it, unplug everything and just, you know, like, I really, I think, I swear I would rather play a show where I said this last night in my um, talk with Jay, 25 people come to the house, we sit on the floor, we play some songs, talk a little bit in between, play some songs, we finish up, we eat some pizza, watch some dark shadows, they go home a couple hours later. I would rather do that than even plug your guitar in. You I'm know? at the point. Yeah. I'm at the point now where um, I like the idea that you presented a while back Yeah. where um, instead of going out and doing shows like we used to do, we should do just nothing more than just an acoustic show, maybe with no amplification. Even. That's, I don't want any amplification. In, in terms of, or if we have amplification, just have it real basic amplification that literally is amplification. It just takes what we're doing, the same sound of the room and just yeah. make it louder and just do it. Like for instance, um, that that potential book signing thing you might be doing yeah. in New Orleans um, at some point. Yeah. That, that me and Dirk just tag along and um, you, you know, after, the, after, after your book, after your book signing, we just go over to the cafe area in the courtyard mm -hmm. and, you know, play a 50 minute acoustic set. Um, personally, it, I mean, I would absolutely love for Lycia to go out and do the full force yeah. electronic Lycia live show that never happened because we never could afford it, but yeah. have it happen as it should happen and, cool and have, you know, the, the, the extra musicians and have the sound crew uh, so that I could just literally walk out and play guitar and sing and you just walk out and sing. But we can't afford that. We're not a band at that level. 
And on top of that, we're not spring chickens and we can't, we yeah. have lives and we have a family. I think that's more of it is the time constraints because we both work full-time jobs. We have a nine-year-old. The people that we would work with also have full-time jobs and families. They yeah. don't live here. They, you know, and if, and if it were, if it was people here, we all still have to figure out a time when we can actually work together long enough to put it together. So yep. it'd be one thing if like somebody uh, somehow magic happened and all of a sudden like a bunch of money fell in your lap and you could quit your job and focus fully on music as what it should be. That'd be a whole different scenario. But in the current scenario, there's just, there's no way of pulling that off. No, there's not. And you know, I, I, we, I did that juggling act when I was in my twenties or I'd work and quit and work and quit. And, and, yeah, you know, and, and as you well know, when we met up and I was, you know, in my early thirties, you know, there would be segments of time where we could work on music and then we would take part-time jobs. Yeah. But we can't do that now. Do that now. No. I mean, we can't do that now. And plus two, you know, the energy level that I feel at this age, I mean, I, you know, you, you can't go, go it's like that. Way past your bedtime right now. So, but <laughs> yeah, it is actually, um, <laughs> I, I daydream all the time about doing that full fledged show, but you know, you gotta be real, real, you know, realistic about it. I mean, Maybe we were never tired. Well, I'm, but I mean, you got to be realistic about it. What we want to give to people in a live setting is something that of a band considerably bigger than us. Right. In terms of finances. Right. I think one of the frustrations I had of touring always was, is that we, it was always a compromise. We always had to sacrifice something to make taking it on the road possible. And I think at times we really pulled it off well, but I think at other times it, we didn't. Yeah. We tried. The thing is at this point, I think for me at this stage in my life and for me at this with my mindset right now, going out and giving a rock solid organic acoustic show is probably the most authentic Lycia you can get because yeah. We, when we do that and we're doing it that way, we're not com concerned about, or we're not distracted by anything. Yeah. Um, when we practice or just, I'm not going to call it practice because we just do this all the time. We do it all when we're the playing time. Song, when we play songs in the living room, we just perform it. We don't think about stuff. Mm -hmm. When we decide to film it for like a festival or something. Once we start getting the technology and setting stuff up, are you ready? You're ready. Then you start thinking and then you make mistakes and then it's not fun. And so that's why if you just go in some place and you're just playing in a courtyard or in a coffee house and then you're just playing, you make a mistake. You just say, oh man, I made a mistake. Let's just start again or stop and tell a story and then start it up again. Laugh at yourself and move on. Well, just make it more natural and more real. Yeah, that's what like the idea too of just like chilling in someone's house like I can definitely see why bands do that now those living room tours or whatever yeah it would be just I mean I you know I have social anxiety so being around a bunch of strangers would probably be awkward in that setting but I think it would be less awkward than uh a lot of things being in an uncomfortable effing goth club with you know the same 10 songs that you've been hearing since 1985 playing on the overhead and you know you're not going on until 12 o'clock at night and and all that and then once you finally do go on and the reverb or the uh, uh feedback is out of control and blah 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 i would rather be in that scenario of sitting in a living room with a, with a bunch of strangers i think as long as they're not scary strangers. Well, one thing that I think about, I've been thinking about a lot lately is I want to sort of try to remove myself from feeling that I need to do anything. Yeah, right. You know, I think being in music for all these years, it's hard to just say, 
okay, I'm, I, I'm going to have a time where I'm not going to do anything because yeah. you're just so hardwired to think, okay, if we're not working on new material or or working on, you know, whatever, we got to be maybe thinking about preparing ourselves for live. And even though well, I see it hasn't played live in a long, long time, we've had a lot of false starts, haven't we? Yeah. Where we well, decide that, we're going to try it. Yeah, that, I mean, it's never, as much as we say we'll never do that again, that's not what your brain has lost. You still have real and deal. I mean, yeah, like, well, if almost, this, happens and this happens, then we could do this and this. And it's the same pattern every year. It's early in the year, and Leipzig contacts us about the, this concert saying, Are you guys game for it this year? It's sort of become a joke. It, it, yeah. ask, ask us, and we're like, Not this year, maybe next year. Don't, so don't we, quit we don't quit asking. So they, they, they ask us, and then we always say, we can't do it this year, but maybe next year. So it sort of spurs us on. So we have this two-year cycle where it spurs us on to do it. And then we realize that it, as it stands now, there's really no way to do it because I, I don't want to go back to being the one guy on stage running all this technical stuff and you're over there. Country. Yeah. Um, especially considering how disastrous our, our comeback show in 2009 was where, I mean, it was just, I remember when we left that place, it was like, I remember I just, we were trying, we were riding home and I just looked at it and you said, I am never doing that again. So I know okay. when you, me, you and Dirk go to Europe, you bring your guitar and we'll just go from house to house of people that we know there and they'll let us stay at their house for a day and we'll play a show for them and move to the, move on to the next house, play a show for them. <laughs> and that way we get a vacation out of the deal for just to pay and playing a couple songs here and there and then just don't come home <laughs> or we just keep on practicing our acoustic stuff and and then just Go find some <laughs> find some good sound person that knows how to take a, a natural sounding acoustic sound and played in a large room loudly with a bit of reverb and then we just go and play um, a handful of shows and show us in Europe. That can be, I, I feel like that could realistically happen. Maybe. Um, we always talk about if we ever found a sound person, it might be a game changer, but. Yeah, well, I think it's doable with uh, Brett's connections, uh, people he knows. And but not that at this point in time I'm searching anything out right. because no, no, no. Um, no. we got sort of a full plate this, yeah. this at well, least until the summer. I'm not allowed to leave the house really yet, so. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, I don't really like as as we talk about. I, I I used to be a person that used to think, you know, five years in the past and five years in the future, and always be thinking about what I'm going to be doing. But over the last maybe five maybe maybe even 10 years i really worked hard of like i'm just in this moment right here yeah and and all right now you know the the ionia thing is um our involvement is really pretty much ended at this point so now my focus is on um, our summer ep yeah and um i think maybe after a few productive weeks three maybe up to um, maybe up to a month we might have the sixth and final song ready to be mastered and then we already have very strong ideas for what we for the cover mm -hmm. and then um once we get that done i'm definitely going to back off back to what i was saying earlier you know after both um, a line that connects in and flickers i was like okay i've said everything i can and i needed in both cases i needed a recharge period of at yeah. least a year yeah. and I'm guessing that after we're done with this I'll, I'll need another recharge I it's not like back in the 90s where I would literally we'd literally finish an album and I would start on the next album right um it was just non-stop now I just I need to have time to just recharge and 
and you know who at, during each time downtime i never know if i'm if we're done and if, if i'm going to come back or but i would suspect that it, this pattern will continue forever because it just yeah. is what it is what we are but i do need recharge periods because um, we have very busy lives very in our non-creative stuff that dominates most of our time and so we're not like normal people in their 40s and 50s that have time to go and do things pretty much every moment of our time is spoken for yeah literally and um to the point where i get quite frazzled at times rushing around trying to do numerous things at the same time yeah. and it's uh, i think so, it's funny when you're working from home and i'll walk in there to go to the bathroom or whatever and you've got your work computer on you've got your music computer on and you're basically like playing I'm multiple like, words. You're, you're I'm, like, I'm like, yeah, like Rick Wakeman of yes, you know, put, put a cape on me and I'm the Rick Wakeman of work. I mean, please put a cape on anyways, just because <laughs> I, it should be like required in the house anyway. Yeah, that would be my work, my work slash music cape and I'll just... Can you imagine when you have to have those Zoom meetings or whatever for work and you're like sitting there with your cape and like the cape, the collars up and like what the hell's going on? Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, anyway, I think we said everything we needed to say. Yeah. Left to add. Yeah. It's sort of been like a two hour plus run on sentence. No, I think there was some good information. Then it kind of just went off the rails when the whole sound uh, scenario. Hey, my one last thing is um, I don't think really I badmouth really anyone besides unnamed Jacksonville people and, <laughs> and Will, Will Welsh. But um, really, in all honesty, um, I haven't seen Will Welsh and. 25 years but I I would I have no really I I'm not a, I'm really not that negative about you as you as you know I've told you numerous times if I got in contact with him I would be open to being friends with him of again and even course. doing a song or two with him again yeah you know I was no saint back then either and so you know that's not like people screwed me over you know I made lots of mistakes back then too you know, it was uncharted territory and just a bunch of kids making stupid mistakes, you know? Yeah. And, and just what it is. So I didn't want it to come out that I was bad. I, you know, I don't think it's right no. to bad more people when no. there's two sides to every story. But anyways. No. Well, and the fact of the matter is, uh, the whole band, within the band, there's been weird relationship issues between each and every person that have since been reconciled. So... It, it it's people have situations i mean yeah that's called being a human being if he came around one day i have zero doubts that you would accept him with open arms and he'd be right back in it just it's nothing to do with, with on your side that you know yeah. who he, where he is or what he's doing or whatever but um yeah. just a bad situation and it's a shame that it happened, but well, I mean, it, it happens with everybody. I mean, it's just sure. it's a it's a story. But my point, mainly being, is that you know I don't like you know ripping on people. Yeah, yeah you know, unless you well, give them. It's only it's only fair, you know. I Besides did. I those, did if that's any consolation. Like that. I said I probably did it. I probably talked worse about it than you did. If that's any consolation, but I'm also like. Uh, what do you call that mama bear about people that uh, I love? So, you know, I'll cut them. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> no. But anyways, no, I don't, I don't, oh, um, I have he nothing really else to say. To no. What? I said he was rude to me, so. Wow. Well, yeah. Well. He's never going to see this. No. <laughs> I don't think he's scouring the internet for uh, Lycia interviews. Not metal enough. No, not cool enough at all. No, not metal enough. Not no. extreme enough. 
Not, not at all. I, I, I do say I think it would be funny if he's still into, you know, black metal and he's a fan of avant-garde records. I think it would be funny if he saw that ad. <laughs> Gotta say. Right. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Whatever, that's just me being a bitch. <laughs> All right. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> let's get off of here. All right. <laughs> Bye. See you. See you in about two seconds. <laughs> yep.